Hey folks, this is Scott Weingart and you're listening to the MCrit Podcast. Today, my friend, my former student, Felipe Turan, on why we are doing CPR wrong. But before we get to that, Stony Brook Medicine, uh, many, many opportunities. If you are a resident and want to train in a three-year program with some of the best resuscitation and emergency medicine training out there, uh, consider Stony Brook. If you are an attending and want a job working at such a place, then contact the Stony Brook Medicine Emergency Medicine offices. But if you are an ED intensivist, if you have trained in a critical care fellowship and are looking for a job that is predominantly working in an EDICU, then contact me. Uh, just go to mcrit.org slash contact and say you are interested. We are looking for young Folks, beginning of their career, just graduating fellowship, and if you're willing to move out here to Eastern Long Island, uh, we have a great gig for you, so get in touch. Okay, enough of all that. Let's get right to Felipe. We're doing cardiopulmonary resuscitation wrong, just like you hear it. It's not a clickbait phrase. I really mean it. I believe we're doing CPR wrong. But I learned from a mentor once that you can't really say something doesn't work without proposing a solution. So the real title for this presentation is, we're doing CPR wrong, T can fix it. But you don't really care whether I mean it or not, or you shouldn't care. You want to see some evidence to support a claim like that, right? It turns out there's actually a fair amount of evidence, in my opinion, largely ignored on this topic. Let's start by putting this into some context. As I've mentioned in prior lectures, I've been um, lucky that during my residency and now during my ultrasound fellowship at Mount Sinai, I've been uh, part of a novel program that is incorporating the use of TE, transesophageal echocardiogram, during uh, resuscitations in the emergency department. Specifically, for the past year or so, we've been performing TE systematically in many of our cardiac arrest patients. You've probably heard uh, the gurus on this, like Rob Unfill, Blyvas, Mike Malin, um, they've all pioneered this novel application and produced some of the evidence uh, we have for its use in emergency medicine. If you're not familiar with this, I recommend you check out the amazing Ultrasound podcast to find a few episodes that they have dedicated to this topic. So without getting into the details of the actual protocol for the purpose of this lecture, I will point out that in every cardiac arrest that comes in, immediately after the patient is intubated, I will place a TE probe and quickly obtain these three main views. These views are essentially equivalent to the apical four chamber, um, the parsternal long view and the short axis views that you get with transthoracic echo. In TE, they're called mid-esophageal four chamber view, mid-esophageal long axis view, in transgastric short axis view. But with TE, can be easily obtained during ongoing resuscitation. And by that I mean with ongoing chest compressions, as you can see here. And since we're doing this brief intro, I want to share this clip with you. I've been giving Grand Runs lecture on the use of ultrasound in cardiac arrest um, at several places, where I briefly mentioned the use of TE. A lot of people has raised the concern that using an invasive tool such as TE can distract our team or take the attention away from key interventions during the resuscitation. This video shows how much, or how little I should say, TE interferes with resuscitation. After obtaining the views that I um, that just mentioned that are needed, the probe can be easily hung and left in place like shown here. So it was during one of these resuscitations that a little over a year ago now, I had this interesting case. I presented this case during a lecture on a related topic at ACIP last year, and it was by far the point that most people asked me about after. That wasn't even an ultrasound lecture. So after seeing a recent ultrasound podcast by Mike Malin, Jimmy Fair, and Pat O'Kersey, where they discuss a similar case that had, uh, Patrick had, I decided I needed to share my thoughts on this. This case not only brought this problem to my attention, but it also made me aware that I th what I think is the most important role for ultrasound in cardiac arrest, and specifically the potential for TE. So this was a 45-year-old male with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest that came in in PEA. Standard ACLS had been performed in the pre-hospital and was continued upon arrival to the emergency apartment. As you can see here, CPR is in progress and I have already inserted 
the TE probe. In this clip here, you can see the first dose of epinephrine going in, uh, seen um, with the bubbles going into the right atrium and advancing into the right ventricle. And this is where the case gets interesting. I had recently read about the importance of diastolic blood pressure as a surrogate of coronary perfusion pressures. So I was paying a lot of attention to this number during each of my resuscitations. At the beginning of this case, we noticed that the diastolic BP at that point was only 14 and the entitled CO2 was 18, as you can see here. Both numbers reflecting very poor quality of CPR, very ineffective resuscitation. We know that coronary perfusion occurs only during diastole in cardiac arrest, and therefore it has been well established that the number um, we really care about as a determinant of resuscitation quality is the diastolic blood pressure as opposed to the systolic BPs. So then we identify this interesting finding. The image here shows a mid-esophageal long axis view of the heart that allows us to assess the LV, the LVOT, and the aorta. As you can see here, the point of maximal compression is right over the LVOT, which is obstructed throughout most of the cardiac cycle. If you analyze this clip in slow motion like I did, you see that the aortic valve actually remains open only about a third of the time that it should be open. This is as a direct consequence of having the area of maximal compression located literally over the valve. So then we decided to, based on what I was seeing on T, reposition the mechanical compression device towards the apex of the heart away from the base. This clip now shows ongoing CPR after having optimized the compression site. As you can appreciate, the area of maximal compression is now somewhere over the LV and the aortic valve remains open about three times the time it was before. Few seconds later, after repositioning CPR, the diastolic blood pressure is now 19 and the entitled CO2 is now 26. Within a minute or so, the diastolic blood pressure has improved to 24 and the entitled CO2 is now 31. After this, after, uh, soon after this, the patient achieved ROSC. So after this case, I was left with several questions. These questions were a direct consequence of having, for the first time, a tool that allowed the real-time assessment of the quality of our CPR. Is the quality of CPR affected by the possession of hands or CPR device? Are there any studies on this issue? Can TE be used to enhance the quality of CPR? Have I been doing CPR wrong in many of my patients? In order to answer these questions, let's review the existing evidence. The evidence I think we have ignored. CPR has been a fundamental part of cardiac arrest resuscitation, basically since it was first described by these two gentlemen, Kuvenhaven and Nickerbocker in 1960. I'm pretty sure I didn't pronounce that well. Now, the recommendations regarding the exact location of hands doing CPR had changed over the past years. For many years, the resuscitation guidelines recommended the use of the internipple line as the anatomical landmark to position hands. However, in 2010, the International Resuscitation Guidelines concluded that the internipple line was not a reliable landmark for hand placement. This was based on several studies of CT scans and simulations in real patients, uh, which had uh, shown that the structures immediately underneath the sternum of this spot are not exactly the ones we intend to compress. One of these studies was the one by Shin et al., Korean group that in 2007 looked at chest CTs performed in 189 patients and looked at the structures located underneath the internipple line. In this study, they demonstrated that about 80% of the cases, the intrathoracic structures located just underneath the internipple line um, was the ascending aorta in 18%, the root of the aorta in 48%, and the LVOT in 12%, rather than the LV itself, which was only found in 20% of the patients. Nestas published recently a similar study confirming this uh, findings on MRI. 
Just like the prior study, um, they demonstrated that in more than half of the patients, the structures located underneath the internipple line were those closer to the base of the heart. However, the most important thing they showed was that there was a significant variation on uh, which structures were underneath it, depending on whether the patient had cardiac disease, aortic disease, or not. We've known this forever, right? There are changes in the location and anatomical situation of the heart related to different types of uh, cardiomyopathy and even variation with age and gender. This is why you would search for the PMI in the first part of your cardiac exam in medical school. So these are findings that make perfect sense. We have just ignored this because until recently, we didn't have a way to assess this in individual patients. I know you might be wondering, well, is there any clinical evidence? So far, you just showed CT studies. That's all radiological voodoo evidence. Show me some actual cardiac arrest patients. Indeed, there is pretty good evidence, actually. The same case I just showed you and the case that the ultrasound podcast guys have been recently shared as well, these are not just random zebras. There is an observational perspective trial published in 2009, yes, 2009, in a journal that you might have heard of called Academic Emergency Medicine, demonstrating that this is actually a problem, an astonishingly common problem. The study from, again, a Korean group led by Sun Huang, performed TEE in 34 patients with non-traumatic cardiac arrest. They looked at the area of maximal compression, or AMC, which was defined as the area of um, the LV or the ascending aorta that was most prominently compressed at the end of uh, compression phase on a longitudinal view of the left ventricle. This image shows an N-mode tracing used to calculate the area of maximal compression. And the results were pretty shocking. The AMC was not located over the LV in any of the cases. So where was it located? The area of maximal compression was found to be located of the ascending aorta in 59% of the cases, like shown in this picture here. And in 41% of the patient, it was located over the LVOT. I know what you're thinking. This is just anatomical echocardiographic proof. But how does this actually matter? Does the area of maximal compression actually make a difference? Well, that depends on whether you agree that the LV stroke volume is important or not. If you do, if you agree that the LV stroke volume is why we're doing CPR, then it kind of makes a huge difference. In fact, as this image shows here, the same study showed a relationship between the LV stroke volume and the location of the AMC. LV stroke volume is on the left and the location of the AMC or area of maximal compression measured as centimeters from the aortic valve is on the bottom. Negative numbers mean that is um, on the LV side of the aortic valve. This linear regression here shows that the LV stroke volume is indeed higher when the AMC is found at the ventricular side than when the AMC is distal to the valve. So you might say, how come the AHA didn't care? How come this didn't make it to the resuscitation guidelines? Well, it's interesting because actually this study won the Young Investigator Award in 2006 at the American Heart Association Science Symposium. So someone actually thought this study was a groundbreaking study. So how come this evidence has still not changed our practice in resuscitation? Well, it is just observational data. The resuscitation guidelines may have considered that this was simply not high enough evidence to change recommendations. After all, this means we've potentially been doing CPR wrong in more, in more than half of our patients. That's what I thought, at least, until I realized I was wrong. Someone had actually recently done the interventional study and validated the concept in animals. Kenton Anderson, an ultrasound-trained emergency physician from Stanford, was thinking about this several years ago already. His team published this pilot study last year. 
The study was essentially the proof of concept that optimizing CPR compression site directly over the heart can lead to improved hemodynamics. This was an animal trial using a swine ventricle fibrillation model of cardiac arrest. Based on the human um, radiological studies showing that the standard compressions are usually located in the ascending aorta, they chose the aortic route to compare to compressions over the LV. They used transthoracic echo with two views, parsternal long and short axis, to mark the location of the aortic route in the left ventricle. Using a thumper piston type mechanical device, they randomized animals to receive CPR at either the aortic route or the LV sites. Once intubated, animals had a TE probe inserted, which was used to confirm the exact location of compressions as per the respective randomization. Then they kept the T probe throughout their entire resuscitation for recording the area of maximal compression. They induced cardiac arrest and performed standard BLS for about 20 minutes before attempting defibrillation for the first time, marking the initiation of ACLS. They gave epinephrine and amiodarone as per the protocols. The primary outcome was coronary perfusion pressure, or CPP, as we know, the main determinant of resuscitation success, and their secondary outcomes included ROSC and some hemodynamic parameters such as aortic, systolic, and diastolic blood pressures, as well as entitled CO2, another commonly used performance marker in CPR. And they found that the CPP, the mean CPP, was significantly higher in the LV group during the 12 to 14 minute interval of BLS and during minutes 22 to 30 of ACLS. The aortic, systolic, and diastolic pressures in, in tidal CO2 were higher in the LV group during all time intervals during resuscitation. And regarding survival, 9 of the left ventricle group, so 69%, achieved ROSC and survived to 60 minutes compared to 0 of the aortic root group. Of course, there are many limitations to this study, including the fact that it's an animal study and it doesn't allow conclusions on any patient-oriented outcomes. That being said, it is pretty clear to me that there is, this is an area with incredible potential for the use of transesophageal echocardiography and resuscitation, and that there are some answers for the questions I was left with after this first case I had um, over a year ago. For sure, the quality of CPR is affected by positioning of CPR. There are pretty robust and consistent studies demonstrating this concept of both radiological and clinical. Not only we have our personal experience as well as others at Stanford or Utah seeing that you can actually guide resuscitation and improve hemodynamic parameters in real time using T, but there is a prospective interventional trial supporting this. And lastly, I am pretty certain at this point that I have been doing perhaps ineffective CPR in many of my patients. And I believe, and hopefully by now you believe too, that T can help us fix this problem. What are the take home points? I believe in more than half of our patients, standard CPR is compressing the wrong structures. Optimizing CPR positioning leads to better hemodynamic parameters and may lead to better outcomes. So what's ahead? Well, there is a lot of work to be done, of course. We need human data, which is underway. I think it's time to bring together the resuscitation science folks in the ultrasound community together and collaborate in order to translate this promising findings into actually improving cardiac arrest survival. Thank you.